Good evening, and welcome to the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and this faith oration. I'm George Walreich. I'm the president and CEO of the College of Physicians. As many of you probably know, we are the oldest professional society in the United States, founded in 1787. And for those ophthalmologists here who do things besides being in the lab or in the OR and follow opera, you of course know that's the year that Don Giovanni premiered in Prague. So we've been around for a while. As you also know, Philadelphia may have more medical schools in the area than any other place in the world. There are seven medical schools in Philadelphia. And of course, there's nothing but the absolute spirit of cooperation amongst all of them and no competition. So the College of Physicians is essentially the Switzerland of healthcare, the UN of healthcare, where everybody can come and discuss things without getting yelled at by their dean or the department chair. We have many different types of programs, youth education, the world famous Mütter Museum, a botanical garden, a world famous library, and increasingly a history of vaccine website, which in the last year has had close to 10 million page hits. We are also the home of a nascent ophthalmologic institute and already are the home of the Schweinitz lecture and as you'll certainly see in a couple of minutes, the Spath Oration. I'm now going to turn the evening over to Dr. George Spath, who will provide more information about this evening's program and the Spath Oration itself. Dr. Spath, please. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Uh, we're honored to have this event again at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, where it's been for 43 years. And uh, we're very grateful for the support of Alcon, Allergan, Glaucos, the Lions Club. Their support is essential. And furthermore, it's remarkable because they don't have an opportunity this year to network. And so they can't really work with the uh, audience as they usually do, but they've supported me <coughs> how. And I'm very grateful for that. Aaron Schreckenbach and Christine Williams of the College of Physicians have been essential in putting this event together. Some years ago, Carl Space, my brother, introduced the speaker. This year, his son, Carl Space Jr., will continue on this evening. Carl. Thank you very much, George. I'm deeply honored to be here before all of you tonight. In introducing this year's Spaith Oration, rather than recounting aspects of my grandfather's professional career, I thought it might be inspiring to reflect on the man who was Edmund B. Spaith. My grandfather was indeed a towering figure. Even as a child, I knew the remarkable contours of his life. Born in 1890 into a German immigrant family, his priorities diverged from those of his father. He went straight from public high school to medical school, paying his own way through the University of Buffalo at a young age. Shortly after graduating, he volunteered to serve in World War I as a field surgeon with the US Army's Expeditionary Forces in Europe. Upon his return from the Great War, he continued treating veterans and married Lee Link his wife of over 50 years. What followed was an extraordinary career, really a thing of history, extending right to the final weeks of his life. I remember him as a driven and busy man who worked hard but not bring the job into the home. Though succinct with us grandkids, he was engaging, approachable and present and at times could radiate warmth. He had high expectations and encouraged us to approach life with purpose, not to just try, but to do. In sports, this meant playing well, hard, and fairly. In school, excelling academically. Among the things that stood out in family life was his love for our grandmother and his unquestioning faith in her judgment. 
Meals with my grandparents were sumptuous formal occasions. Most topics were welcome at the table, so long as they were informative and presented thoughtfully. Disagreement was not unusual, but conversation remained civil as each participant spoke in turn. In such settings, I generally did not speak unless spoken to, but when asked a question, understood that a well thought out and coherent response was expected. Though only 11 years old at the time of his passing, I was aware that my grandfather's life had been impactful. This was borne out over the years through numerous chance encounters, more than I can possibly count, with people from all walks of life who asked if I was related to the Dr. Spaeth. I can often sense their deep gratitude even before answering yes. He saved their eyes was the most frequent comment. To them, the ophthalmological procedures performed on their loved ones were simply miraculous. I doubt my grandfather, Uncle George, or Philip would ever have described the work in such a way. But I believe they understood their ability to make direct positive differences in people's lives. For those of you in the field, please know However, you may choose to categorize your work, that for most of us, what you do is nothing short of miraculous. And to all of those of you that are here tonight, I appeal to you to keep pressing on in your efforts. Through all of you, my grandfather's legacy continues to this day, magnified countless times over. And now I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Puldev Singh. Dr. Puldev Singh is Professor of Ophthalmology and Director of the Glaucoma Service at Stanford University School of Medicine. He was born and raised in the Washington DC area, but did spend eight years in India during his childhood. After receiving an undergraduate degree majoring in biology and economics at McGill University, he received his MD and MPH degrees from the Johns Hopkins University and was a Dana Foundation Fellow at the Wilmer Eye Institute, Johns Hopkins Hospital. Following residency training at the Casey Eye Institute and a Heed Foundation Fellowship at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, Dr. Singh joined the Stanford faculty in 1992 rising to the rank of professor in 2003. Within the glaucoma and ophthalmology communities, Puldev is an advocate for the patient's perspective and is not afraid to provide views that challenge prevailing dogma. And with that, Dr. Singh. Thank, thank you very much, Carl. And George and George and the college, especially Aaron and Tina. Uh, it's a tremendous honor for me to deliver the 43rd annual Edmund B. Spaeth oration, particularly given uh, the amazing person that Dr. Spaeth was, was, truly dedicated to his family, to his patients, to his students, extremely courageous. Uh, he lived an incredible life. And, and above all, brutally honest, someone who just called it like he saw it. And, um, you know, th these are qualities that I've thought about when preparing this presentation today. And uh, I would have hoped to have been there in person to share uh, this moment with friends. I have a tux, actually I mentioned to George, I have several tuxes. Uh, and it would have been great to get together at the college, uh, but, um, this, but this format, uh, you know, having had to delay the, this for a year and do it over Zoom has provided us an opportunity to really assemble an all-star cast of panelists from around the world uh, with, at different stages of their career with different perspectives. The idea is not to build consensus, but rather to have a discussion and then perhaps some ideas on how we move forward and um, so we'll be joined by the panelists, and I'm going to limit my remarks to about 30 minutes, uh, after which we will go right to the panel. And uh, I think you'll find the evening to be uh, hopefully enjoyable. I certainly am looking forward to the panel. Uh, these are my disclosures. All humans are conflicted. These are my disclosures. Uh, and um, I also have some nonprofit and governmental organizations that support my work. Uh, and 
the topics I'm going to discuss today include um, the fact that the average uh, is not a good predictor of what is to come. Uh, guidelines based upon averages don't serve individuals well. Knowing in advance what the future holds may not be necessary to provide optimal patient care. And it's okay uh, for the doctor to say, I don't know. Um, now, uh, these are very general statements. And uh, I'm a glaucoma specialist. And so, and all the panelists are a glaucoma doctor. So the evening will be somewhat glaucoma heavy, but really the, the principles and concepts apply uh, to not only all areas of medicine, but to many areas of life. And certainly in ophthalmology, we've seen uh, physicians deviate from the results of trials and to uh, do things differently than what the average results were in trials. And uh, certainly this is true in the case of uh, whether or not steroids are beneficial for optic neuritis uh, or should be used for corneal ulcers, uh, whether or not infants undergoing cataract surgery should receive intraocular lens implants, and what is the optimal dosage for anti-VEGF injections for age-related macular degeneration patients? These are all questions that have been addressed in trials, but there's absolutely no substitute for physician judgment based upon clinical experience. And even more importantly, there's no substitute for what each physician learns from each patient. Uh, and certainly we are all students. And, and one of the, really the major point of the lecture today is each patient is different. Don't take average results of trials to guide you because you'll be wrong more often than you are right. Now, in our field, we've had the alphabet soup of clinical trials that have looked at glaucoma and shed uh, a lot of light on the relationship between uh, risk factors and disease and have uh, looked at different disease states and different IOP goals. And I'm going to tell a story of one trial that had a profound impact on, um, on our profession because it relied heavily on averages. And, uh, and, and two decades later, we're still trying to recover. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, the goal here is to be brutally honest, and this is how I see it, uh, and, uh, and we'll have debate and, or at least discussion on this later, but the trial I've chosen is the, the Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study. And this is a trial where patients were randomized when they failed medical therapy to get either laser trabeculoplasty or trabeculectomy, which is incisional glaucoma surgery. And the trial, which was a, a large study of several hundred patients, showed that if you do trabeculectomy, you lower pressure further and patients uh, preserve a vision better. But a post hoc analysis of this trial, uh, which grouped patients in both, uh, from both uh, treatment arms into one group, uh, divided the patients based on the proportion of visits that their pressures were under 18 millimeters of mercury. And the group that was always under 18 millimeters of mercury had an average pressure of 12.3. And this 12.3 was not the average of all the patients who were represented on the line. It was the average of the averages. So individuals on this line may, may have had average pressures over eight years of 14 or 15 or 16 or four or five or six. The 12 was the average of the averages. And that group on average showed no change in the visual field defect score. And this slide led some to conclude that if your pressure got to 12.3, your glaucoma would stop progressing, that you would now, it would now be stabilized. Uh, and another thing to note about the study, this analysis is that uh, the y-axis goes from minus three to five here. And this is the, the average change in the visual field score presented here. Now to go one step further, this group also showed in another post-hoc analysis that if your pressure was under 14 on average, for the first 18 months of the study, uh, going forward, you did better than if your pressure was over 17.5. Now, uh, again, relying on averages. And uh, the, uh, one of my colleagues, Ruby Thomas, uh, had a statistician plot the results with the entire y-axis that, uh, that was possible in the study, which gave very different looking results. Uh, it still showed that the group that had the higher pressure didn't do as well as a group with the lower pressure. Uh, but uh, the one major difference here, of course, is that it doesn't look like there's that much difference between the groups. And, the, and this, I think, is a truth that has been overlooked, that glaucoma generally progresses slowly. So the myths propagated as a result of average results from this study included uh, that if your pressure is above 12, you're going to get worse. If you're below 12, the disease is stabilized. 
uh, and that the disease generally progresses quickly if pressure is above goal, and that because of all of the above three, uh, you need to diagnose the disease early and treat aggressively to preserve vision. And this, ha this happened all at around uh, the turn of the century uh, and, um, and really had a profound impact on, uh, on really solidifying the dogma that if pressure is above a goal, the glaucoma will get worse. And if you, if you lower it below a goal, you'll stabilize the disease. Uh, and this, of course, made uh, discussions with patients very simple. When the, if the pressure was higher than the arbitrary goal, you could tell the patient they needed another medicine or surgery. If the pressure is below the goal, you could tell them they're doing fine and send them home. And so pressure became everything. And, and post-ages glaucoma care uh, for a couple of decades involves diagnosing the disease, setting a goal based on averages from, a, often based on averages from a trial or based on algorithms derived based on data that is, is thought to come from averages from trials. And then you advance the treatment until the goal is achieved. But there's no mention of safety of therapy. So, uh, so this implies that you, you basically treat until you reach a pressure goal without, without concern about safety at all. And we know that in clinical practice, uh, patients do uh, have their therapies uh, determined largely based on the safety of, of, the safety of therapy undoubtedly plays a role. And even the most staunch ab advocates of the target IOP uh, concept will tell you that they'll often decide not to do a, a surgical procedure, but will be happy to do laser or use a medicine if they haven't reached their pressure goal. So what they're doing is essentially changing the target. Now, if, if, so if this wasn't bad enough, uh, recent work, and this is a collaborative effort uh, with several individuals and several institutions and the Food and Drug Administration, uh, this is a part of a larger initiative uh, that looks at patient preferences and patient reported outcomes for minimally invasive glaucoma surgical devices. As part of this initiative, uh, Tian Zheng Li and Jimmy Lee from the Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, found that when you ask patients what's most important to you, more important than driving a car during the day or night, maintaining mobility inside or outside the home, or even reading fine print, is having control of their intraocular pressure. Patients are more worried about their pressure than they are of, of being able to see. This would be similar to a cardiology patient being more concerned about their cholesterol on, than they are about symptoms of congestive heart failure. And this has not come from anybody other than physicians. The physicians have conveyed this information to patients that it's all about intraocular pressure. And I think they've done our, our field an incredible disservice. I'm gonna step back a little bit and talk about the big picture of glaucoma disease. In the United States and in most industrialized countries, less than half of individuals who have glaucoma at any given time are aware that they have the disease and only a fraction of those are under care. And many under care are often non-compliant. I think at best we're getting to 15 or 20% uh, to, 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 who are doing everything that they're told to do by the doctor. But fortunately, there's great variability in the natural history of the disease and a very few individuals go blind from the disease, relatively speaking, and I'll show you some numbers later. We also know that lowering IOP reduces but does not eliminate risk. Now, another way to look at the big picture is in Philadelphia and in most communities, uh, there'll be individuals that are at higher risk and others at lower risk of vision loss from glaucoma. I represented the lower risk individuals with green figures and the higher risk individuals with red figures. Now, the, these, uh, the proportions may differ based on the community. Clearly in, in communities where there are more African-American, uh, uh, larger African-American populations, you'll see a greater prevalence of disease and also more severe disease. So if half the individuals uh, are have, have uh, with the disease are aware they have the disease and only half of those are under treatment, 15 are gonna be at risk. But really, the greatest risk is to the three that are based on genetics at higher risk of developing severe vision loss. And the other, uh, the rest of the 15, many of them will go on and live pretty normal lives, whether or not they're ever told they have glaucoma uh, and whether or not they're treated for glaucoma. Most patients do well, but a subset are destined to do badly. And we don't know who those are and up front, even though we're getting better with risk factors, there's just too much variability that we don't understand. Now, a lot of, most patients with glaucoma will progress slowly, such as this patient who over five years developed a very mild uh, visual field defect in fear, inferiorly. And we have the luxury of time in, with, with those types of patients. Now, 
In contrast, sometimes patients present fairly late in the game when they present with very severe vision loss uh, and uh, advanced uh, damage from glaucoma. And in those patients, we sometimes don't have the luxury of time. We have to act quickly. This, of course, is less common. Uh, now, how, common, uh, how commonly do we see fast and catastrophic progressors versus patients with slowly progressive disease? Well, this has been looked at by Bal Chauhan and colleagues in, in, in Canada, where in a real world clinical setting, they found that only about 3% of patients are fast and catastrophic progressors. If you look at the remaining overwhelming majority of patients and look at their mean deviation, their change in visual function over time, it looks like a normally distributed curve around no change. The noise seems greater than the signal. Not a lot is happening and certainly nothing is happening fast in this population. Saunders and colleagues uh, have mod uh, postulated based on modeling that over a 50 year period, only about 10% of individuals uh, will have visual impairment from glaucomatous disease and only about 4% uh, will go on to blindness. Now, uh, what about the trials? Well, um, in the two large clinical trials uh, where uh, groups, patient, uh, patients were uh, followed for a long period of time, the collaborative normal tension glaucoma study and the early manifest glaucoma trial, as you can see, there's tremendous spread in how patients do, and the average really just doesn't tell you what's going to happen. In the EMGT, we, uh, this is courtesy of Anders Hale, uh, if you remove the patients with, exfoli from, with exfoliative glaucoma, as you can see, those are the ones that did the worst overall. And if you look at everybody else, it looks a lot like the data we see from Canada, from Chauhan's group. Not a lot is happening, and these are untreated patients. In fact, a third to two-thirds two of patients in, in untreated glaucoma uh, trials show no change over the course of the study. In the UK glaucoma treatment study, two-thirds of patients who received placebo showed no change. In the early manifest glaucoma trial where the change, there were very sensitive uh, uh, change parameters used, uh, still a third of patients with no treatment over six years, uh, over, uh, over seven years, sorry, showed, uh, showed no change. In my own clinical practice, roughly a third to half of patients that I, I, see that I saw initially who were told they had early glaucoma and needed treatment that I decided uh, could benefit from not being treated, but rather followed conservatively over time, uh, about, a, about a third to half of those patients have not required treatment in my 29 years of practice. And this is based on my, my clinical impression. And I can tell you that no group of patients is happier than the group who came in being told they had glaucoma and needed a lifetime of treatment. And you decided to watch and wait, and it turned out they didn't change. Now, this is a, a paper that Augusto shared with me this morning. This is recent work from the uh, ocular hypertension treatment study where patients followed 20 years uh, with ocular hypertension uh, showed only 25% only of the patients showed visual field loss and only 1% of the patients in this, in this trial showed severe vision loss. And so overall, with patients who have ocular hypertension, which makes up about half of the treated group of pa glaucoma patients in the United States, or treated group of patients when it comes to IOP lowering therapy, <clears throat> there, was, uh, there was no change over this period. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about a unique data set that we have at San Francisco General ha Hospital. And this is work I did collaboratively with Sean Lin. This is a, a population where uh, the patients get their medicines in the same building where they get their care. The pharmacy is in the building, so we're able to get good data on pharmacy refills and also follow these patients longitudinally. And again, I want to really point out that Sean did the heavy list lifting because this is a, a teaching hospital for UCSF where Sean was uh, the chief of the glaucoma service for a long period. What they found when they looked at non-compliance with therapy was that there's only one predictor of non-compliance and that is disease severity. If you had mild disease, you're less likely to take your medicines than if you have moderate or, uh, or severe disease. And what this is, is, is patients pushing back. The doctor saying, You're, you have a disease, take your medicine. The patient saying, you know what? I don't have symptoms. I'm not going to take the, the medicine. And you know what? A lot of the times the patients are right. They don't have a disease. And, and non-compliance may be a way uh, for many patients to get it right when the doctor's got it wrong. Uh, now, and I'm not encouraging non-compliance, but just pointing out in the real world with so much unnecessary treatment, not all non-compliance is going to lead to bad outcomes. Another uh, finding in the same uh, population we noticed is that over a decade, 
poor follow-up showed a strong, strong, strong correlation with disease severity. The people who were doing badly are the ones who weren't showing up. Now, causation is hard to prove in this retrospective type of analysis. It's not a prospective trial that looks at where you can get a better idea of causation. But it sure looks like people who are not showing up are doing worse. And what's really interesting is the patients who are taking their medicines, actually going to their pharmacy and getting their medicines, were more likely to be missing appointments than the ones who weren't taking their medicine. So maybe those uh, who were not taking their medicines were afraid that they better get checked up, whereas those uh, who were uh, taking their medicines were thinking, hey, I don't need to see my doctor. I'm taking my eye drops, so I'm going to be okay. Well, in reality, you're not going to be okay. Far more important, in my opinion, than compliance is surveillance. The people that do badly are those red figures with, who are destined to do poorly uh, and just don't come back, whether they're taking their drops or not. Uh, and the, the reality is with the pandemic, there are more and more patients asking for refills and taking their medicines, but not really following up. And I think that's a recipe for disaster. Why is it that we don't put more emphasis on this? Well, with non-compliance, there are many stakeholders who want compliance to increase. And certainly there's a lot of money pumped into educational events that stress compliance because there are obvious stakeholders in patients using more medications. Uh, but in general, glaucoma doctors are, are not angry if their patients don't come back. In fact, we have so much more inflow than outflow in our clinic populations uh, that uh, we don't do enough to make sure patients stay in the system. And we really need to develop better telemedicine and remote monitoring techniques to stay in touch so we can find those subsets of patients destined to do poorly. About, uh, it's about the same time when the clinical trials came out that um, had such a profound impact on glaucoma practice, a group of us, a small group of us wrote an editorial. Uh, and uh, you know, this was at a time when the majority of uh, US and probably doctors all over the world were embracing the, the, the concept of 12.3 or at least aggressive IOP lowering. And, and this is a quote from that article that John, Don Minkler uh, wrote. We should remind ourselves to make decisions within the limits of resolution of our tools. Scientific honesty demands we pretend not to pretend to be, we not pretend to be more precise than the inherent errors in our measurements and fund of basic information allow. I, I think Don said it all with this comment. There's so much we don't know. And, and George, I think put it best when he explained to me that when a patient comes in and, and asks, how, 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 you know, am I gonna lose my vision from glaucoma? Uh, what should I do? What's gonna happen to me in the future? It's like asking someone to look at a picture of a car and, and, uh, and, um, and tell, tell you what, how fast that car is going. With cross-sectional information, you can never make predictions about individual patients and be right most of the time because there's so much variability in the natural history of disease. And it's okay to just say, I don't know. People you know, travel for, for, uh, for, in, for long distances to come see me from California, from other parts of the country, some friends from the other parts of the world. And it's difficult to tell them that you don't know what's gonna happen to them uh, in the future because they're looking for expert opinion. But most of the time, especially when you don't have longitudinal data, that's the only answer. You just have to say, you don't know. But the good news is you don't always have to know because as long as you, those people stay in the system, over time, you can adjust treatment accordingly and, and, uh, and, and treatment of, of all diseases has to be dynamic. So I personally don't write a target IOP in the medical record. I think we have crude tools to measure IOP. There's no way to prospectively predict glaucoma, of course, in a particular patient at a given IOP. We know that there are risks and costs associated with all therapies. And we know that patients can become overly fixated uh, on intraocular pressure. We suspected this for years, but this recent work by Lee and Lee have, has, has really shed light on this. And ultimately, of course, the goal of glaucoma care is not IOP lowering, it's, it's, it's the patient's health. And we do damage by telling patients they have glaucoma when they don't. Now, people may ask, well, if you don't set a target IOP and treat, what do you do? Well, what I do is I treat based on risk benefit of the therapies we have available. So when I start, my first treatment, I asked myself, are the risk, is the risk benefit profile of this treatment, uh, some, is it favorable for this patient at this time, given what I know about their disease? And I asked that question every single time. And I certainly asked that question every time I advance therapy. Now that's not as easy to explain to a patient and it's somewhat a concept that's difficult to even explain to trainees 
sometimes, but it's the only concept that practitioners who practice glaucoma appropriately use. Those who write down a target IOP, I have no problem with that, but, but those who are adjusting treatment based on risks and benefits of treatment uh, and then changing their target IOP based on the risks and benefits of the next treatment are in fact doing exactly what I'm doing. It's just they're not necessarily explaining it that well to their patients and to their students. Why am I so adamant about this particular issue? Well, it's, it was really my experience in the 1990s looking at a cohort of individuals that guided the, some of these thoughts. Back in the mid 90s, uh, Palo Alto, my community was, was Boomtown. Uh, the, 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 in, you know, the, the tech industry was starting uh, to really take off. And uh, we, had a lot, we had a lot of people coming in from overseas. And one subgroup were, were young male Chinese engineers uh, who uh, were started presenting with, with uh, glaucoma. Uh, and it was, a surpri it was surprising to see uh, the, this cohort presenting with sometimes with mild disease, sometimes with very severe disease at a relatively young age. And, and most of these patients were told uh, that they needed uh, a glaucoma filtration surgery yesterday to get a pressure of 12 or lower because that was the prevailing dogma at that time. And we decided to not treat these patients aggressively, but to, just to follow them. So these are 16 patients from age 25 to 66. And none of these patients progressed at the time we wrote this paper with seven year follow up in 2007. Uh, and uh, and what we what we found uh, what, what we uh, what we postulated was that uh, that these patients, most of whom were myopic, had had strain on their optic nerve that had resulted in field defects, and over time were not continuing to show damage. We later found out this also occurs in women, and we were sad to find that some of these patients had received trabeculectomy with mitomycin C without ever being followed longitudinally, uh, and men and women, and and. Uh, they were, they were treated based on cross-sectional data and were told they need a very low intraocular pressure because that's what the trial said. That's what the average trial showed. We subsequently, subsequently did a pilot prevalence survey to find out how common this is and found that about five and a half percent of individuals of Chinese ancestry in their 20s and 30s living in, throughout the United States had these features characteristic of glaucomatous disease. The Koreans found something similar uh, and Han and colleagues went one step further than us. They studied, looked at these individuals longitudinally and found that while there was a progressive stage, but over time, their glaucoma actually stabilized. And this is what we were seeing clinically. And, uh, and so that in, the early, uh, uh, in early adulthood and mid middle age, they might show progression, but later in life, there's a relatively stationary phase well beyond the, post, uh, well beyond the myopic years. Uh, I was uh, intrigued to hear Paul Kaufman talk about the effects of accommodation on the posterior segment of the eye in his Friedenwald lecture. And I'm not going to bore you with other theories, but uh, it is quite possible that accommodation with its effect on the back of the eye, which Paul has shown very nicely ultrasonography, by, by ultrasonography, is, is causing glaucomatous-like changes uh, in this subpopulation. And uh, this certainly will need require further study. Now, one other thing I, I should point out is that uh, I'm not the first to have this idea that there are subgroups of glaucoma. Many have talked about this and Luke Pasquale in, in a beautiful uh, AGS subspecialty day lecture talked about a few of the categories, but there are many, many more. What we call glaucoma is many different diseases. And so it's not surprising uh, that patients in these subcategories are not gonna behave like the average. Now, up till now, I've been trying to convince you that there's a lot of overtreatment out there. But treating based on averages also results in undertreatment. And I, I'm seeing many, many, many patients continue to lose vision with pressures far less than 12.3 millimeters of mercury. Sometimes 12.3 is not a low enough. Now, for most people it is. Uh, for most patients are not gonna progress uh, even at higher pressures, but certainly when you get low pressures, they do okay. But our, our population is aging and there are individuals who I thought in their 60s and 70s would probably not go on to lose vision from glaucoma disease, but later in life, some of them are continuing to lose vision uh, to the point where their central vision is threatened. And the proportion of individuals over the age of 80 uh, with glaucoma disease is gonna increase fourfold in the next 25 years. And so we will have patients, older patients who need much lower intraocular pressures, although the proportion of overall glaucoma patients that need very low pressures is small, 
the numbers are just so so high, the proportion, the number of people with glaucoma is so high that we still will have to know how to get the pressure really low. And I'm extremely worried that the numbers of trabeculectomies as, is falling in fellowships. People are doing lots of tubes and there's an increase in the MIGS procedures, but over a four year period, there was about a 40% drop in the number of trabeculectomies being performed. So this I think could lead to a public health crisis because we will need to have operations that lower intraocular pressure into the single digits. So a uh, few final thoughts before we move to the panel. Uh, so glaucoma care today fixates on early diagnosis. There are groups of scientists, groups of doctors out there saying they have the answer on how you can find glaucoma earlier. And, to, and, to, and are trying to get around this, uh, uh, get, you know, get around the difficulties of, for, of confirming a glaucoma diagnosis by saying that they've developed algorithms or methodologies to tell you who has glaucoma. Uh, and uh, as I've told you, as I've you know spoken about earlier, I don't think that we can we can know with good confidence. But I also want to make the point that it's not important to know because I think I think this is a fruitless exercise. You don't need to know if someone has glaucoma early because you shouldn't be doing anything for patients, particularly those with preparametric glaucoma, other than following them. Uh, with, with, this increased, with the increased sensitivity of the tools we have, we're, we have more false positives, we, we have treatment or over-treatment of many who don't need it, and we have under-treatment of some who need very low intraocular pressures. Most of all, there's insufficient emphasis on surveillance. I'm not against finding more people who may have glaucoma in the future, or maybe even have it now, but really the emphasis should not be on early treatment. It should be on finding these cohorts and following them carefully to, to separate the ones, the red ones from the green ones, to find out who are the ones that are really at high risk that need more aggressive treatment and which ones, which patients can be followed more conservatively. And finally, I think uh, there's suboptimal appreciation of the patient's perspective. Uh, we, you know, when you tell someone they have glaucoma, it's a big difference in telling them if they may be at risk of glaucoma. I think we have to be careful about using the glaucoma diagnosis. One other thing I'm really bothered by is the fact that uh, the way we looked at optic nerves when I trained, stereo-optic disc photographs is disappearing uh, at, because there are these new imaging devices that people use. And the problem is a lot of these devices over the past 20 years at least have not been backward compatible. And so there were, you, know, you don't have the luxury of this photograph from 10, 15, 20 years ago that tells you how far, the, how fast the car is moving. Uh, because you, you really just have a series of cross-sectional data points that can't be compared with other data points. And, and this, I don't think is a step forward. And finally, we have the problem with red disease. People on imaging tests found to have abnormal measurements who are told they have glaucoma. And this is a preparametric non-disease entity, which some people call glaucoma. In the US, it selectively afflicts those with good health insurance and or significant disposable income who get bombarded with tests and frequent visits and treatments and for oftentimes for a disease, for a disease that they don't have or for a non-disease. Everyone benefits except the patient. Um, you know, the whole healthcare system, well, actually the whole healthcare system doesn't benefit because this is a costly exercise and these funds may be better spent on trying to find patients with real disease. But unfortunately, this is a real phenomenon, and I think we have to fight this. I do think that the patients are going to get more engaged with care. And this is a slide courtesy of Malvina Edelman from the FDA. Uh, certainly, we've seen this it, with uh, lots of diseases, uh, rare diseases and cancer in particular, where patient advocacy has uh, demanded access to treatments. But overall, what, what we've seen is just greater education uh, based on the internet and just patients wanting to know what's going on. And this concept of the provider telling them that they have a disease and telling them what the treatment is, uh, is, is, I think is going to ultimately disappear. I think we're gonna to need to form partnerships with patients. So I do think we're making progress there, but there's a lot of work to be done. So I'll end by saying there are a few areas where I think we can really move forward. Uh, we can improve screening of those at risk. We have Anthony Kawaja here, who's gonna tell us hopefully a little bit about genetics who might improve our odds, uh, ways to improve our odds to find out those at risk. Uh, we, we also have to do a better job of longitudinally following individuals to assess individual risk. We need to treat patients based on, not just on pressure goals, but rather on the risk benefits of the therapies in the context of an individual patient's disease at a given time. Surveillance is at least as, as important as compliance. We need to keep an eye on patients longer 
I think it's much easier not to treat like I do uh, is, is if you tell patients they have to come back. And oftentimes the trade-off with patients is we can give you this medicine and start treatment and I can see you every six months or even less frequently, or we won't give you the medicine, just watch you really closely to see if you actually are going to change. And most of the time, the patients will choose the latter because they'd rather avoid treatment and just come more often and, and uh, be followed more closely. And I certainly would want that for myself. And finally, uh, I've made a case for uh, do, treating less for patients at low risk. I think one of the other mistakes we make is we don't, we, we don't treat soon enough. We wait too long to aggressively lower IOP for those who need it to maintain vision. So there's a continued important role for surgical procedures that give us very low intraocular pressures because there is that subgroup that's going to do very badly without aggressive care. Now, I want to thank uh, the college once again. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tina, uh, especially Erin, for her heavy lifting. George, uh, who's been a mentor and friend and someone uh, with whom I, uh, I continue to have dialogue about uh, ways to, to make care better and just about every other thing related to life. It's a tremendous honor for me to give this uh, oration today. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. And I'll just introduce the panelists briefly. Augusto is our Blanco from uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. Anders uh, Hale will, uh, is, was going to join us, uh, but he has sent a recorded uh, video of his comments. It's uh, you know obviously very, very late in Sweden right now. Anthony Kawaja uh, from uh, Moorfield's Eye, he's a youngster, so he can stay up this late. Uh, Carla Siegfried from Wash U, uh, Tosin Smith from the Glaucoma Associates of Texas, George, of course, and then Remo Susana Jr. from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. So uh, let's let's get the panelists to weigh in. And uh, uh, I know, Carla, are you on right now? Could you, could you uh, maybe start off with uh, some comments? Sure, I'd be glad to, Cole Dev. Welcome everybody. Um, excellent presentation. I know I'm supposed to uh, uh, try to challenge you on many of your concepts and I actually uh, uh, agree with a lot of what you've said. Um, one of the things that you didn't mention that has become uh, popular um, even beyond looking at large data and clinical trials, even well-designed clinical trials is the concept of looking at um, very non-granular uh, Medicare uh, data uh, or iris data. Um, large data is great, but what can we learn about our individual patients? And so if you look at it sort of at a, as a stepwise approach, you have that patient sitting in the chair in front of you. And I, I love trying to understand how I'm going to approach this patient, not only from their the standpoint of glaucoma, which the whole concept of IOP and this uh, glaucoma light or pre-parametric glaucoma that now is a surgical disease drives me crazy. Um, but we have to really understand where the patient lies in terms of risk. And I think that the concept of longitudinal analysis is so, so important. And we are learning, look at, look at the OATS data that you mentioned, the 20 year data, um, you know, less than, uh, if, if you look at the whole analysis, less than 50% went on to develop glaucoma. Um, and that included the analysis of those who died. And actually about a third died during the study and one third um, developed glaucoma with one fourth developing visual field loss. We as physicians don't always pay, follow our patients long-term. You and I, Coldev, and many of those on the panel have been in practice for over 25 years and we've stayed at the same place. And so we followed those patients, but I really, really worry about our patients now that move around. And hopefully with uh, electronic medical records and patients becoming more involved in their care, we'll have the ability to track their data long-term. Um, wouldn't it be nice if everybody had a photograph of their optic nerve um, from five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, emphasize with the, is the issue of cost. Um, risk benefit ratios are critical, um, but we also have to include cost in that. 
um, because as we look at uh, as whole populations, whole societies, we have to think about um, the issue of cost. Um, and I have to comment on your uh, uh, article on trabeculectomy must survive. This, this goes to my heart, Kaldev. And uh, I actually gave a presentation at our Grand Rounds recently about uh, trabeculectomy eyeing extinction. And someday we may need centers of excellence where there are people who do lots of trabeculectomies. Um, we're keeping it alive at our institution. I'm teaching the fellows, but there's fewer and fewer institutions out there that are providing that training. And that, that concerns me a lot. We're providing a lot of MIGS training. I'm all for MIGS in the right population for the right patient, but a MIGS is not a trabeculectomy. Tosin, you want to comment? Because you're, uh, you know, uh, you're at the forefront of both, right? I mean, you're a leader in the MIGS space, but also uh, someone who I think believes passionately about TRAB as well. Do you want to, you want to share some of your perspectives on Carla's <laughs> thoughts or, or, or anything actually? Um, today, I, I, this week I did three traps and I, I you know, I, I would go through the surgery and I've seen patients post up and, uh, you know, you get the outcomes that you're looking for. There is, there's just no doubt about that. Uh, trabeculectomy, I agree, is here to stay. And I always joke that I may have to get one of my partners to come out of retirement to do my trap if I ever need one. But in, in talking about that, brings me to a point that I thought about as you spoke. Great talk, by the way. Um, you know, we talk about safety of therapy, but we should also as individual physicians consider what is good, what works well in our hands. Uh, the, my experience from doing a trabeculectomy, just as Carla alluded to, may be completely different from somebody else's based off of their training. And so we should make sure that we know how surgery works in our individual hands when it comes to that time of, of creating or providing the best care for individual patients. If I know that long-term, this patient is somebody who is a fast progressor, somebody who needs a lower pressure, for instance, and the visual field loss or, or looking at their glaucoma progression analysis is one where they have severely progressive disease, they definitely need a procedure that should, would lower their pressure for the long term. Then I will consider that before anything else. So it's remembering to individualize the patient. Look at the patient in front of you. Know what their history is. Know what their risk factors are. And uh, if you have enough information, I'd be able to make, um, make a choice on that patient's behalf, involving them in the process. Um, to get them to that goal where you es estimate that they will be in a couple of years, they will appreciate you for that. The other uh, comment I would like to make is uh, regarding, you know, your, your comment about uh, IOP and where we've, we've put that uh, in, in the mindset of patients. We've talk, we talk about IO intraocular pressure all the time and patients worry about their intraocular pressure. This question probably goes out to, to my co-panelists as well. Um, I think for many patients, intraocular pressure is a indicator of the state of their disease. Um, how do we correct that? What do we give patients to hold on to in this time um, that would um, be more specific as to where they are with their, with their glaucoma? Um, Diabetics have an A1C. They know where they're supposed to be. Or it's an indicator of how things have been. Which of the things that we currently have available to us will help us reach? Everybody needs something to hold on to. So that's that's a question for you. But I, I agree, trabeculectomies are here to stay. We need to, to modify treatment to the patients in front of us. We need to do better about deciding who needs treatment and who doesn't. And um, be able to a certain not, uh, the people's rate of progression over time. You're muted. Yeah. So Ramo, Ramo, I know Ramo has to leave early. So I'm going to give let him have a word. But we want to we want to keep our Europeans up a little bit longer because they know so much more than us that we need to make them more tired before they make their first comments to level the playing field. Uh, so Ramo, why don't you have a few say talk and then we'd love to hear from from uh, Augusto and Anthony. As always, as always, I agree with you, Kurdve. It's a fantastic lecture. Uh, you showed clearly the need to personalize treatment in glaucoma. It's very well taking this point. There are people that know what they know, 
there are people that know what they don't know, and there are people that unknow what they know. And this is very common in science. Uh, as a matter of fact, to make things worse, that you, the scenario that you painted, the Glaucoma Foundation 2017 reported, unfortunately, it's not possible to estimate the chances of maintaining a person vision once they have been diagnosed with glaucoma. The John Hopkins Hospital 2018 reported, unfortunately, looking at the real statistics, about 15% of glaucoma treated patients will be blind in one eye. That's a tragedy. In the British Medical Journal editorial, editorial 2018, Paul Glasio and Len Shermers wrote, most clinical trials don't help patients. Over 8% of research is wasted. It's clear that we are not doing our job well in this regard. It is interesting that the main factor for glaucoma progression, elevating intraocular pressure is usually measured five seconds, in five seconds, two or three times a year. That is altogether 10 to 15 seconds sample. The year has approximately 31 million and 104,000 seconds. Therefore, measuring 15 seconds intraocular pressure during a year is a very poor sample of intraocular pressure behavior. Despite that, this poor sample is used, as said before by Dr. Smith, is used in glaucoma decision making. In addition to that, intraocular pressure occurs in 50 or to 75% outside normal office hours. And although are the most, one of the most important intraocular parameters for glaucoma progression, it's rarely mentioned in published papers or estimated in clinical practice. Finally, as you said, Code, the over reliance on new newer glaucoma diagnostic tools such as OCT leads to over or under diagnosing glaucoma if it is interpreted in isolation without taking into consideration the complete clinical picture. Although under diagnosing may risk the quality of vision of a patient in the future, the implications of over treatment are very deleterious as increase the cost of treatment affects the quality of life and subjects patients to a risks of side effects without much gain. I wish the lecture given by you, Code, and the panel discussion will initiate a deep thinking process amongst the ophthalmologists. So diagnosis and treatment can be optimized. Again, as you said, Code, physician experience, judgment, and the communication skills are critical for optimizing health. Thank you for the opportunity. I am very honored to be part of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Remo. I appreciate you joining us. Love to hear from the Europeans and George. Now, uh, you guys have been very quiet, uh, but uh, Augusto, you turned off your uh, mute button. So love to hear from you. You, uh, I'd really value your opinion on these matters. Oh, well, no, thank you very much. Uh, um, and it's a great pleasure to be here with George and, and, and everybody. I mean, just some thoughts about, uh, you mentioned the, the future challenges we have to take care with, uh, of people with glaucoma and aging, age is an important risk. And um, without your aging population, you're going to face difficult challenges. But myopia was mentioned before. And myopia, uh, the, the, the prevalence and, uh, of myopia is increasing uh, dramatically. And even in European derived populations, young people, about nearly 50% of them are myopic. And this is due to the change in lifestyle in a generation. And in my experience, myopia uh, leads to uh, a lot of false red disease with OCTs but also missed uh, glaucoma diagnosis because the optic discs are more difficult to interpret. 
So I think that it is a challenge for us uh, to, you know, it's going to get only worse in the future. Um, another something that I'm very, uh, I work and also cool that you have work as well about um, quality of life uh, around mix. And I think that uh, as another challenge that we need to do better, how to, again, glaucoma is a slow disease and, and we should take the opportunity of of uh, knowing patients and what's important for patients. And the questionnaires, how, no, no matter how well the signs are questionnaires and validated of quality of life, at the end, you know, they represent domains that are important for some people or the majority of people, but those domains may not be important for the other people. And how individual patients weight each of the domains is very individualized and needs to be individualized. And also how does change over time? Um, that's also a critical factor because patients adapt and what may be important for them at a particular time may, may not be that important uh, later on. I think we need to do better to inform our decisions. Uh, that we don't know well our patients. Um, and lastly, I would like, you know, uh, to finish, we, we can only hope that people like Anthony, you know, uh, and the really smart uh, scientists can help us to, uh, ideally to detect who is going to get worse, you know, perhaps genetics, artificial intelligence. I think that science is going to help us in the next, in the future. But I guess what I'm trying to say that, that the glaucoma will continue to be an art uh, uh, and a caring uh, uh, interaction uh, for years to come. So thank you. Thank you, Augusto. Great, great comments. By the way, we're getting some great questions and I'll address those after we've had, everyone has had a chance to speak. Anthony hasn't. And then it, it, after everyone's spoken, I'm gonna play uh, Anders's clip. Anders has a four and a half minute clip that he sent us and then we'll open it up for the questions. So please keep sending in your questions. Anthony, turn it over to you. Hey, th thanks, Colbert. Uh, excellent talk. Um, so, so a few things to pick up on. One, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, looking at trials to see whether we can predict the risk of people getting worse. And then big data was brought up, maybe, you know, the, the IRIS registry. The real problem we have with big data is that all of us around the country treat our patients, most of us, and, and maybe not you, Calder, but so we don't know those people who just started on Latanopros and they haven't got worse over... 10 years, whether they would have got worse if we hadn't given them uh, latanoprost. And, and that makes, um, you know, my job and other people's jobs at trying to predict who are those people who wouldn't have got worse or would have only got worse very slowly if you hadn't treated them, very difficult because we're not doing that. So I wonder whether more of us should be managing patients potentially in the way you do, Caldev, or, or whether maybe that's even worth a trial on it. Uh, is, is that worth a trial, right? Treat, treat people or, or do this uh, surveillance, maybe as a pragmatic way of, uh, of, of, of testing whether it's safe to do that. And maybe if it is, then more of us would do that. And that might generate more of the natural history data we need to make these predictions. Um, yeah, I, well, I think until, it's a great point. Until we do that, we have the untreated groups in the clinical trials that help provide some information there. And I, I shared some of that with you. And yeah. uh, this might be, George, you want to comment or should we hear from Anders first and then you comment? Uh, what would be better? George, you're on mute. Still on mute, yeah. I think, can you unmute George, uh, Aaron? There we go, sorry. Uh, Anders, well, let's hear from Anders. Okay, uh, uh, can you play, uh, Aaron, can you play Anders' talk? If not, I could, I think I might be able to do it as well. Oh, there it is. Good morning, my name is Anders Hain. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this discussion. Dr. Singh's presentation had the title Personalized Care, Going Beyond the Average.
We must remember that the goal of glaucoma treatment is important. I practice in Sweden. Sweden is a very egalitarian society where everybody should be treated the same. But that is certainly not a good principle for patients in a glaucoma outpatient department. Instead, such patients should be treated and followed according to individual needs and preferences. These vary a lot depending on patient age, whether the disease is manifest or not, the stage of the disease, and the patient's personal preferences. I really agree with Dr. Singh that making a very early diagnosis is not very necessary. I do not see that as desirable at all. Giving a patient a diagnosis of glaucoma reduces the patient's quality of life, as shown beautifully by Udvai in this study from Norway. Preperimetric glaucoma is a risky diagnosis. It is very often wrong. Red disease is more common than true glaucoma if OCT is administered in a non-discriminant fashion and with less than perfect image acquisition. I never tell a patient that she or he has glaucoma unless I'm seeing manifest glaucoma with field loss. But I know that if I see repeated field loss in the same area of the visual field, the diagnosis is almost always correct, as we saw in this study on EMGT patients. Sometimes I might treat patients with, without field loss. If they, for instance, have very high pressures, or very suspect looking discs. But then I tell the patient that they recommend treatment, not because he has glaucoma, but because I suspect that there is a large risk that he may develop glaucoma over time. And I would not do that in an old patient. This wait and see attitude is probably more common here than in the United States. Working with fixed budgets and not being able to bill for services, remove a lot of the incentives for overdiagnosis and overtreatment. When initiating treatment, we can benefit from some knowledge of risk factors for progression, and we have a pretty good knowledge of those. But we should remember that risk factors explain only a very small part of the very large interpatient variability of disease progression rates. Everybody has seen this target IOP graph from the EGS. Certainly it provides some guidance, but we should understand that when diagnosing a patient with glaucoma, we cannot predict the rate of progression. And like Dr. Singh, I do not write down the target IOP in the medical record. Instead, I follow European recommendations and make sure that I obtain five to seven fields in two to three years. After that, but not before, I know the patient's rate of progression. I can then forget about all risk factors and population means, and I know how to pro provide true individualized treatment. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of the meeting. I always have a, a, a play at home in Sweden if, if I, I don't make it in the US, uh, I guess. Uh, George, your thoughts? Uh... Kolov, I think uh, there may be some questions from the audience, but I think uh, uh, I'll say something at the very end, but I think uh, maybe you want to see if there are questions from the audience. Also, I want to know what your response is to the comments that have been made. Well, I, I think those have been great, great comments made. I think what Anthony's talking about, I think is being studied. I do think there is, and I, 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 can't, I think maybe Bull Bankston is doing work in this area of, of, of having untreated glaucoma, early glaucoma. Um, and, uh, but I don't wanna say for sure, cause I, I believe there's a trial, but don't quote me on that, where, where, some, where the Swedes are looking at this issue. But, but uh, I remember hearing something about it I don't know if, if you guys have heard heard this at all, but uh, the point you make is a good one because you know you, you once you begin treatment, uh, 
and the patient's stable, you assume that the treatment must be working because they're not getting worse. And it, it, unless you, uh, so you can't really answer the question if that patient needed treatment or not. And that's why uh, you, you, know, you, you really have to do the, these trials. But I do think the early manifest glaucoma trial is an example of a trial where we're not talking about ocular hypertension, but really newly diagnosed glaucoma, uh, where uh, uh, half the patients got no treatment, zero treatment. And, uh, and I think we have the data from that showing that you know, a third of patients showed no change. And the delta between those that received treatment and, and, uh, and those that didn't receive treatment was actually less than 33%. So the benefit of treatment was less than the absolute number who didn't progress without treatment. Uh, so treatment, you know, so something to keep in mind, obviously that trial didn't lower pressure as much as some other trials. And one thing I don't want anyone to misinterpret is that I uh, mean to saying, is I, don't, I certainly don't believe that pressure should not be lowered a lot. In fact, I'm saying that in people who have bad disease, you should lower it more than we're lowering it. Uh, and in many others, you should be lowering it less than you're lowering it because they haven't shown demonstrated progression. It's just that the average tells you very little about any individual patient. And unfortunately, the average is guided treatment. I know from EMGT, the mantra that Augusto probably remembers and George remembers is, and Carl I'm sure remembers, is every millimeter of mercury gives a uh, lowering gives you a 10% reduction in risk of progression. Well, that's an average from a trial. Is, is going from 20 to 19 the same as 12 to 11 in each patient? I mean, is one millimeter the same? I mean, these types of mantras that come from averages of studies, I think have been a setback and uh, we have to fix that somehow going forward. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, I, I can't think of anything else, uh, any specific questions other than uh, to say that it's really great to hear that Anders uh, has joined the group before that I showed in that editorial. Who also, don't believe that a target IOP is absolutely necessary. Although, you know, I don't. I, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have anything against people who write it. We have a, 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 a question from Daniel. Uh, I think it's Daniel LaRoche asking: um, Is do pseudofakes progress less quickly uh, than uh, than fakeic individuals? And is there any benefit for doing cataract surgery earlier? Uh, I was wondering if maybe Tosin could take that one because you know, you're doing a lot of cataract plus mixed procedures and maybe perhaps a lot of cataract surgery alone also. Well, for many of the mixed studies that were done, um, we, we saw that cataract surgery in itself is a sort of form of glaucoma surgery. It reduces intraocular pressure to a certain extent in patients where they were the um, comparison group, so to speak. Um, in, in terms of progression of these patients, I personally don't have any um, data that shows that they progress any less. When talking specifically about intraocular pressure reduction, we, all, we have all that data from all those clinical trials where mixed procedures were done that shows that pressure was lowered. And, and um, anecdotally, if we, we know lowering pressure does uh, reduce progression. Um, using cataract surgery in itself as a glaucoma procedure, uh, will depend on the individual patient. How, uh, what kind of pressure lowering are you looking for? Does the patient really need cataract, cataract surgery at that point in time? And more importantly, uh, we shouldn't forget that there are risks to cataract surgery. If a patient has real glaucoma, then the glaucoma needs to be addressed. If the patient has a cataract that needs to come out and some pressure lowering that may be required, you may not need, even need to tag on a mixed procedure. The cataract surgery by itself may lower the, the, the pressure by a few points uh, that you're looking for. Terrific, terrific. I have, I have a question for Anthony from the crowd. I don't know if this is from Rob Feldman or another Feldman, but it's from someone named Feldman. The uh, question is, are there specific genetic markers that can help us in the real world to identify the higher risk glaucoma patients within our communities who need more aggressive treatment? Are markers ready for prime time? Can, would, would you base aggressive versus lighter treatment based on genetic markers or is it, are we not there yet? Anthony, unmute. Being honest, I think I, I I I think we're not there yet, but I but I think it's exciting times. Mo most of the genetic studies, and, and you need really large studies to to look at the the the, the genome hypothesis free, are uh, being cross sectional. So it's how fast is this car moving? You know, we, we just know that they're cars, so we know glaucoma versus no glaucoma. 
What's exciting, though, and I don't think we would have been at this point, we would have predicted we'd have been at this point, say, eight years ago, is now we, we know enough of these common genetic markers that when you put them cumulatively, we can start to predict who in a population will get glaucoma rather than not get, get, get glaucoma. But whether that score is going to be of use clinically, whether within a clinic of treated people, so remember, we won't know who wouldn't have got worse had they not had treatment, who would have or wouldn't have got worse if they had treatment. Uh, we, we, I, that's something that, that I think a few groups are moving on to do in the next few years. So we might be able to answer that. One glimmer of hope is the, the, the number one genetic variant for IOP in glaucoma is in a gene called TMCO1. And when the OATS investigators added that variant to their OATS risk calculator, it was really significant and it had a really big hazard ratio. Um, so if, if you think whether you're deciding whether to treat an OATS inocular hypertensive or not, you think about their age and IOP, cup disc ratio, having both risk alleles compared to none was equivalent to being 33 years older or having a cup disc ratio 0.43 larger or a baseline IOP 12 millimeters of mercury uh, higher. So quite a striking result. It needs replication, but that might give us an insight into in the future how this information might complement the other things we already use to help us decide whether to treat or not. Great, great, uh, great comment. Uh, there's a question that really gets to the heart of this uh, this uh, panel and the presentation. Uh, it's from uh, Ari Aki Shukla. Um, many of us see glaucoma patients as second opinions. We are provided minimal or no longitudinal visual field data, but the patient expects us to be able to give a recommendation. How do you recommend handling this in patients with manifest disease? How do you tell them uh, what they need to know? George, why don't you answer that one? You have more experience with, than any of us. How do you, how do you, uh, did you, did you hear that? I went sort of fast on that question, uh, on that uh, reading of that question. Um, Kulib, I'm gonna pass on that because uh, I've got some other comments I wanna make a little bit later. Why don't you okay. pass on that yourself? Well, I'm gonna know, I'm gonna ask Augusto because I wanna hear the European perspective, then I want Latin America, then I want uh, the US. Augusto, you probably have people driving to Belfast who, who come to see you with data, like you know maybe a couple of visual fields for two over six months, and they they want you the expert to tell them what's gonna you know you know what's gonna happen. Uh, how do you handle that? What do you tell them? Well, again, it depends, I guess, how severe is the glaucoma. Um, I think to me that's a critical factor, of course, and, and life expectancy. But you are assuming that uh, if it's someone with early disease, you know, it, it's a, in a way an easy, an easy conversation in a way, uh, because glaucoma, you know, again, the, the early disease is not going to cause problems. The majority of people under care will have effective treatments. It's very rare that um, people will have significant problems. If severe disease, I guess you can have information on how long have you been uh, treated with glaucoma, um, but it's difficult. I mean, I think that uh, patients, uh, you would hope you can explain that we need, again, longitudinal data to give uh, information and recommendation, uh, because without that, it's impossible. We cannot be, you know, have a, a magic ball to to predict nor to find out what has happened in the past. So, Remo, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, what do you do? I mean, you're the expert in Sao Paulo. Uh, people come and uh, what do you, do you have anything to add to what uh, Augusto said about patients wanting an answer from the expert and uh, with limited uh, historical data? Yeah. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball to predict what we're going, but we have some indirect factors like the age of the patient, the severity of the disease, the rate of progression. That means the patient is young and the visual field is severe. Although I have only two visual field, I know that this visual field was in, uh, getting worse very fast. Third, the pressure that the patient has, because if the pressure is low and he's progressing, the chance that I cope with that is less than if the pressure is very high and they can reduce. And I always said to the patient, 
don't worry. We are going to try our best to avoid that you progress to the point that your quality of vision will be impaired. But we have to pick, pick, to pick up the whole picture. Yeah. Carla, any thoughts? Uh, well, if you ask me to start and then I <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm, as I listen to others, I'd like to make a comment. I think the most important thing that you can say to a person like that who comes is, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And let's see if we can find out. But what we need is better data if they're in the early stages. And what Augusto said about stages is critical. If they're in the early stages, we need better data before we can even start to answer your question over time. And if they're in the late stages, well, then it's so easy. Anybody can answer that because they got bad glaucoma and they obviously need treatment. Yeah, I, I would just say the hardest are the ones in the middle. Because That's in the right. early stages, you can tell them you can re usually reassure them and tell them things are not going to probably happen fast. And, you know, you, know, you watch and wait and uh, get more longitudinal data. In the late stages, when they're on their last few neurons, uh, you sometimes have to operate or do something really aggressive because you don't have the luxury of time because you, you've been referred a patient with very bad disease. But I think the hardest are the ones in the middle where they have moderate disease. They are at risk of, of vision loss, substantial vision loss in their lifetime but you don't have clear information on what's been happening over the past five years and whether the damage occurred at, at a time when they were you know, on, at higher pressures or lower pressures or whatever. And so I usually don't act. I usually, and I certainly don't use trial data to say, hey, you've got this amount of field loss and your pressure 17 or 19 or whatever. And based on these studies or these algorithms, uh, you need a target of 15 and blah, so we're going to operate tomorrow. Almost always, I let some time pass and, and get more data. I, I, you know, I do a lot of fields on these patients and do them, I might do them every three, three months or so for a while. Uh, you know, often at times I do fields twice a year, but sometimes I'll do them more frequently when you're just not sure if you have to act or not act. Uh, and, uh, but uh, sometimes you have the benefit of savvy practitioners if you go back, you can find data from their offices and that helps. But the, most of the time on those intermediate patients, I am usually not signing them up for surgery on that first visit. I'm usually trying to wait a little bit of time. And I actually think, I actually think that gives a patient more confidence too, that you didn't jump to uh, a, an answer right away in those intermediate patients. How about Carla? Okay. Carla, what are your thoughts? So I think it's also important to uh, see if this is a bilateral disease or whether it's very asymmetric because you're going to learn about one eye based on what's happened to the other. And if they come in, they're not going to notice what has been going on if it's usually a, a very unilateral uh, condition or if they just rubbed one eye and they all of a sudden notice that they had vision loss. Patients don't notice even severe glaucomatous um, visual field loss until very late stages oftentimes. And I think that's a really important uh, note. Um, and if they have bad disease in one eye and moderate disease in the other, you're pretty darn sure that they're going to progress in that eye. Um, I always tell patients, you have two eyes, but they're both in the same body. And one just might be ahead in terms of progression. Again, assuming that there were no other factors of trauma or steroid use or, or whatever in the fellow eye. Okay. Um, and I think we really have to uh, consider life expectancy. Um, and nowadays those numbers are uh, very different than what they were 30, 40 years ago. We see very young uh, patients in their eighties and nineties. And what I mean by very young is you still have 10 or 20 years to manage them. And I emphasize that it usually gets a giggle from the patient when I point out that they're young, but I explain to them why I come to that conclusion. I look at their medication list. I talk about their family history and their parents lived long past 100 that, that they're probably going to live that long as well. And we need to be prepared for that. And I don't want their vision to be the limiting factor to their quality of life. Just so, want to make a quick yeah, comment. Tosin, go ahead, yeah. 
regarding longitudinal data that we've been talking about and, and how we can, we can garner this type of information. The one thing to note during iris registry studies is that currently the iris registry doesn't house visual fields or images. So if we hope to be using this information in that kind of way, I think we have to work a little harder about getting that information somehow into the registry. The other comment uh, was regarding uh, what Anders says about uh, you know, the European glaucoma community and doing five to seven visual fields. Well, I don't know if that's possible for us to do the way we, we run things currently in the United States. And virtual reality field testing and that type of thing, home visual field testing, may be a way of, of you know, being able to achieve that goal in a meaningful way for patients in the future. So if, we, if, we, if we're thinking of changing the way we practice uh, and deciding who needs treatment versus who doesn't, uh, we have to, to start be we have to be, be forward thinking and making sure that we we have the data to be able to, to make this type of change. Yeah, so I, I kind of practice like Andre said, five to seven over two to three years doesn't seem like that many visual fields. That's about about two and a half per year, uh, which is about half more than me. I often will get two fields a year on patients with advanced disease. It's pretty 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 common for me. Uh, so, but, but I agree with you. I think something portable, and there's a lot of questions that are comments on better ways to do surveillance. Home surveillance on, on, uh, is definitely something that I think could really move our field forward. But one thing I do want to point out to Carla's point is pa patients not noticing vision loss delayed. Certainly true for most patients with glaucoma, but when they do, when patients tell you, doctor, I've seen worse, I'm seeing worse now than I did two or three months ago, or uh, and it's and, and there's no other explanation like macular degeneration or cataract. You know, I I take that very seriously. And to me, that most of those patients end up getting trabeculectomies in my practice because uh, and George taught me this years ago. He said when the patient tells you they're seeing worse, forget the field, <laughs> forget everything. If it's from glaucoma, you better do something about it. George, you want to comment on that? Well, cool. To, uh, unless there are a bunch of other questions uh maybe we can um, close up what do you think i think i was just going to ask you if this is a good time for you to do your to make some wrap-up comments you know it's almost time for anthony and augusto's clinics to start on the for the next day here and we don't got to let them get a little bit of sleep they're not on call residents and fellows anymore <laughs> well then let's why don't i make a few comments yeah. I'm listening to the uh the people speak, listen to you speak, and then listen to the people speak. There were some, there were some things that really came across strongly. Anders quoted from European guidelines and we said that the purpose of treatment is to promote the well-being of the patient. The purpose of treatment is to promote the well-being of the patient. The purpose is not to control pressure. It's not to prevent visual field loss. It's not to prevent the retinal nerve fiber layer from getting thinner. It's to promote the well-being of the patient. And in the early stages, it's pretty easy because the patient is asymptomatic and you can't make an asymptomatic patient better. Any treatment is gonna make the patient worse. Now, you may need to do that because they may be asymptomatic and you may find that their disc is changing very rapidly. And you and I was so delighted to hear uh, Dr. Seyfried talk about life expectancy. It's key. You must know how long or you must have an estimate of how long a patient's going to live. Otherwise, you can't make any reasonable judgment as to whether treatment is necessary. Because if the patient's asymptomatic, no treatment is justified unless you have a reasonable certainty that the person is going to develop troublesome symptoms. You have to know that. Otherwise, it's just guesswork. And you're going to treat a lot of patients who don't need treatment. Uh, and so remembering our purpose is really at the top of our list. And our purpose is not to control pressure. What a travesty that that's what patients have come to think is the purpose of, you know, 
shoulder pressure. What a sad comment. And uh, so remembering our purpose is key, but I'd like to extend this because in your introductory comments, you said something about, you were gonna mention some things that applied to more than glaucoma and maybe to life more broadly. And I would like to pick up on that because what we've been talking about is do we pay attention to the real thing or to surrogates? Do we pay attention to what really counts or to what's a proxy for what really counts? And I think that's some place that we really need to think a lot about because in our world today, we're quickly becoming a virtual world. And a virtual hug is no substitute for a real one. And so I think your what you were getting at was really important, Kulib, and I thank you very much for an excellent talk. And I thank the panelists too, because I think what it points out to us is whether we're physicians or car repairmen or painters or pianists, our job as a pianist isn't to play as many notes as fast as we can, is to try to transmit that emotional impact so the listener is gonna swoon. And I think we need to do that with our patients to promote their well-being. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you, Ramo, Carla, Tosin, Augusto, Anthony. Uh, it's been a nice evening. Thank you very much, all of you. I think we should close it up. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Virtual hugs. Hugs, everyone. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs>